Hey everybody, this is Taylor Sparks again and we're back with another video in our materials informatics series. Now today we're going to talk about features. In fact, this video is kicking off a series of videos on featureization, which is how you go about creating features. But before we talk about how to make them, let's talk about what they are first. And this dovetails into our last video, which described the differences between some of the different um, terms that get thrown around between artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, right? We said that artificial intelligence is all about getting machines to do tasks that normally a human would have to do. So uh, examples of this are like rife in pop culture. We see, you know, HAL 9000 from Space Odyssey 2001, Skynet from Terminator, the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica. And most of the time, these uh, AIs become really convenient bad guys and villains because in these uh, movies, they sort of already know everything. And so the logical path is so clear to the computer and it very often means, you know, wiping out humanity as we know it, right? But what's missed there is how did it come to actually make those decisions, right? If you don't have all of the information and you're actually trying to make decisions based off of missing information, what do you do, right? In other words, when you think of the definition of machine learning, right, that it's a task based off of finding patterns, right? Where you never tell them how to do it, you just give them examples and they have to learn those examples. Well, how do they do that? They use clues, right? And the clues are what we call features in machine learning. So uh, one of my favorite books I ever read uh, when I was uh, in high school, I read this book um, as part of a great books class by the author Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is the book uh, in the Sherlock Holmes series, The Hound of the Baskervilles, right? So I love this because Sherlock Holmes is all about, if you've seen the movies or read his books, you know that he will notice things that other people don't notice. And then he will draw conclusions and come to the, the, the correct conclusions based off of really small clues. Uh, there's a great example of this where there's a doctor then they're trying to sort of uh, deduce things about the doctor from clues that they see and they've got his walking stick and from just his one walking stick Holmes has all this information that he was this 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 and then he even says and he has a dog which is larger than a terrier and smaller than a mastiff and then there's this paragraph that says how he knew that he says well the dog's in the habit of carrying this stick behind his master being a heavy stick the dog has held it by tightly by the middle and the marks of his teeth are plainly visible the dog's jaw, as shown in the space between these marks, is too broad, in my opinion, for a terrier, but not broad enough for a mastiff. It may have only been, by Jova tried it, a curly-haired spaniel, right? So features are clues. Just like Sherlock Holmes can look at clues to infer something about you know, the case that he's working on, machine learning algorithm, if they don't have the target, but they're trying to predict it, the clues are the things which hopefully are correlated with the target that allow a machine learning algorithm to predict the target. Now, um, if we pull up the wiki page and look up what features are for machine learning, this is what it has to say. It says, in machine learning and pattern recognition, a feature is an individual measurable property or characteristic of a phenomenon, okay? And then it goes on to say, choosing informative, discriminating and independent features is a crucial element of effective algorithms in pattern recognition, classification, and regression. So we've got our three characteristics of features. Informative has to tell you something about what you're interested in. Discriminating, it can be used to separate and actually, you know, separate your data. And then independent, we don't want to have features that all provide the same information. We want independent new information with our features. So with that said, one of my favorite things to talk about uh, features and machine learning models is actually the idea of predicting people's heights. Here you see this awesome picture of Sultan uh, Kozin, I think he's Turkish, with Chandra Dongyu, I think is from Nepal. This is the tallest and the shortest person in the world, right? I like this example because we're familiar with people and we have a pretty good feel for what things correlate with height, right? for one, like weight, right? We know that heavier people tend to be taller, right? Um, you could say a bigger shoe size tends to be a, a taller person if they got a bigger shoe size and so forth, right? So I've just listed here a couple of variables and let's kind of go through these and think about whether or not shoe size in inches, shoe size centimeters, age, favorite food, race, shirt color, gender, zip code, their status of asleep or awake, genome sequence, occupation, eye color and weight, whether these would be useful features for a machine learning model that was trying to predict height, okay? Well, here's what I come up with. Well, first off, we think of shoe size. We gave people shoe size in inches and centimeters. How does that 
fit in our criteria? Well, I would say that we need to throw one of those out, either shoe sizes in inches or centimeters. I guess we should keep the centimeters because we're not barbarians. We shouldn't be using metric. We should be using metric and not um, you know, imperial units. But in any case, these two, shoe size and centimeters and inches, are not independent of one another. It's the exact same information. It's just been transformed. And so that's not helping our model. It's just confusing. And actually, it also does something harmful in messing with our ability to figure out how much of the overall prediction is due to what features. If you have multiple features that are all giving you the same information, you should really pool those together, right? That information and then use that for your feature weighting. And this messes that process up when you have uh, data that's not independent from one another. Um, I would say that age is going to be a good one of, of height. Young people, you know, they grow over the course of their lifetime typically, and then they shrink actually a little bit when they get older, right? Um, gender is important. Males and females and humans are very different heights. We have a pretty big dispersion difference. Um, you've got weight, we know that that is correlated. Um, we've got race, different ethnicities and uh, might actually have different height uh, variations in them. The genome sequence, this one's tricky because it's a really complicated, it's a huge piece of information and embedded in there in some small areas perhaps is the genes associated with height. And so while technically it could be used as a feature, it might be challenging, right? Because there's so much there and such a small part of it um, is responsible for the height that it might be a challenging feature to use, right? So a highly complex feature. Um, occupation, I think that's probably a weak feature because some are weak because it might not be discriminating. Take, for example, if somebody says they're a basketball player, you're going to assume that they're tall. But if they say they're an accountant, you're like, I, I don't know what to do with that information. So it's not necessarily discriminating. It is in some cases, but not in all. So it's a weak feature. Um, eye color, that's probably another one that's, I doubt that's strongly correlated with height. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, zip code, I think this might also be weakly correlated, and it might be a second order correlation where instead you might get different races of people living in different zip codes due to socioeconomic status, and since race itself is the root thing that might be more tightly correlated with height, um, zip code might be a second order one. So again, that maybe isn't independent or maybe it's only weakly dependent. I don't know. Um, obviously, things like favorite food, shirt color, sleep and awake, those are not useful because there's no correlation between those, right? They're, they're not providing inf information. They're not informative descriptors. And they're certainly not going to be discriminating if they provide no useful information. So uh, you can see some examples of this, by the way. <laughs> There's a number of different data sets available for predicting height, right, on places like Kaggle. And you'll see right away that what they have is height uh, with other variables. For example, here's one showing height versus weight. You can see here that they've got weight in pounds and height in inches. And for 25,000 people, I think this data set is, you see that there you go. So while it's not like a an amazing perfect correlation, there is a correlation here that could be used for a machine learning model. Weight would be an important feature to be able to do because you'd say that, well, the lighter the weight tends to be lower height. And as you get to higher weight, you get with higher heights. Here's another one. This is showing the correlation between shoe size in centimeters and height in centimeters. And it's showing it for men and women. And so clearly you can see that men in this data set tend to be taller. And I think that's the case, generally speaking. Women tend to be shorter and larger shoes tend to be correlated with a taller height. So these are examples of features you could use. And so feature engineering is this idea of taking your domain knowledge as somebody who understands the field that you're working in and thinking to yourself, what sort of features would be useful for that field to, in order to make predictions better? Okay, now some machine learning algorithms are able to tell us which features matter the most. And that's really useful because that gives us interpretability in our machine learning models, right? It's there, If a model just says like, this is the person's height, um, that might be great if all you care about is predicting their height. But if you're a scientist, like most of us are, and you want to figure out the mechanism of why is that person taller or why is this phenomenon occurring, then you want to be able to point to the feature that is the most important and then come up with hypotheses about why that feature would have this end result, right? That would be interpretability in machine learning models. And that is really important for, at least for material science, we care a lot about that. So not all algorithms tell you which features uh, are the most important, but some do. For example, so what you're seeing here is a map of Boston. Uh, I lived out here when I was going to grad school. We lived out here just right here by Spy Pond. Now, 
housing in Boston is crazy expensive. And so there's actually become a really famous data set in the data science world of the housing prices in Boston. And then they give you a bunch of features and it's things like crime rate and all sorts of things like that. The square footage, the number of rooms, things like that are typically in the data set. And you could use those features to then try and predict housing based off of the where it is in the neighborhood and all that. So let's go ahead and take a look at that data set. Okay, so here's the data set. You can see that it has, you know, however many observations, you know, thousands or whatever it is. And then you've got all these different features. You've got crime, the per capita crime rate by town. You've got the proportion of residential land zoned for lots over 25,000 square feet, right? So it's a, a fraction of basically big lots versus small lots. You've got proportion of non-retail business acres per town. Uh, the Charles River dummy variable, which basically says, you know, I think it's proximity to the river, if it's by the river or not. You've got nitric oxide concentration. So people measure the nitric oxide concentration, um, and that could be correlated with home prices. Average number of rooms per dwelling. The age of the home, right? The that's the proportion of owner-occupied units built prior to 1940. Um, the weighted distance to the five Boston employment centers. The index of accessibility to radial highways. The full property tax rate per 10,000. And then the pupil-teacher ratio uh, by town. Uh, anyways, so lots of interesting, potentially valuable features. And what you see on this is that uh, they're able to, you could go feature by feature through this data set, let me move this over, and you could see whether or not they're correlated with the, uh, the target, which is the price in thousands, right? So for example, the tax value, right? Here's the correlation, right? You can do the same thing for the index of accessibility, right? So the parameters here, you can see that as it's higher, you get a bigger spread. When it's lower, it tends to be higher values. You could go one by one through these, right? And you could figure out which ones are important for predicting home prices, right? And so there's actually been some cool competitions on this on Kaggle where they said, throw your best machine learning algorithm at this and figure out uh, if you can predict the model, uh, predict the home prices with the most effective model possible. Now, there's lots of different teams that have done that, and I'm not familiar with who's won it or not, but here's one uh, output from one of the models where they actually show the feature weight, and that's what I wanted to show you here, is that of all these features, let's say you built a linear model or a random forest model or something that reports feature weight, you could then say that the feature RM, which was this average number of rooms per dwelling turned out to be the most important feature. And that makes sense, right? When you buy homes, I'm, we're buying homes right now. And it's definitely the case that the larger the home, the higher the price. And so that's going to be the most important feature, followed by LSTAT, which was some other measure, right? The lower status of the population, percent lower status of the population. So poor parts of the town tends to be lower cost housing, right? So anyways, this is the feature weighting. This gives you interpretability to your models, and that's going to be really important for lots of machine learning approaches. So we will talk about in a future video how you generate feature weighting when we get to the different algorithms, because not all algorithms can do this, and some do it in different ways. But that's what I mean by feature weighting. It just says, of all the things that could be correlated with your property, how much does each one matter? Okay, a quick note on featureization versus feature engineering. So featureization is a way to change some form of your data. Maybe that your input data is initially in the form of text data, maybe it's a graph, maybe it's time series data. You have to transform that into a numerical vector for doing your machine learning model, right? So you have to turn it into numbers, right? So we will talk about featureization, for example, in our very next video when we talk about how you go from a chemical formula to you know, an array, a numerical uh, vector, basically, that can be used for the model. And so featureization, that's different than feature engineering. Feature engineering is just anything where you're transforming these numerical features in a way that helps the model work better. Maybe it's introducing new features, right? I, I think about that when I think of feature engineering. It's, it's you saying, oh, as a material scientist, I know that I should be thinking about such and such uh, an aspect of chemistry or structure or whatever in order to make it work better, right? Um, so in feature engineering, the features, they're already in that numerical form, but in featureization, you're turning them into that numerical form. Okay. So the last question before we end this video is to think to ourselves, well, what sort of materials features should we be thinking about? Which ones are available? Which ones should be useful for predicting whatever we're trying to predict? If you're trying to predict structure, if you're trying to predict a property, depending on what you're trying to do, different features might be valuable. In general, the types of features that are used for materials informatics um, basically scan the whole range of you know, length scales when you think of materials from the electronic scale where maybe you're looking at 
bonding, right? And so the features related to bonding are things like electronegativity, um, size of the ions, right? The uh, number of valence electrons, the column in the periodic table, all these things are related to the you know bonding basically, uh, or the electronic structure. Or maybe you could say my property cares more about the atomic structure, like the crystal structure, right? Maybe it's the coordination environment, right? Is it a cubic coordination environment? Is it a tetrahedral coordination environment? Is it the certain types of bonding? Is it a different, right? Right? Something there at the crystal or atomic level. Or maybe you zoom out further and say my property actually cares more about the microstructure, right? Maybe you've got multiple phases and it has to do with the phase fraction or how they're percolated or connected together, right? You need to quantify that in some way. Or maybe it's at the even zoomed out further, the macro scale where you've got, you know, different uh, materials and so they can have different thermal, physical, basic properties like density or color or, you know, physical properties like hardness or whatever else, right? So the point is that all of these things might matter and you don't have to, you don't have to just restrict yourself to one category. You can throw all the materials features at it that you want and most algorithms have a clever way of only using the ones that they need or you can go through what's called feature reduction and you can actually reduce the dimensionality of your features once you know which ones are important and which ones are not important. So with that said, I think we've set the stage to talk about some of the different featureization techniques, and we will cover the first one, which is the composition-based feature vector in our next video. So stick around. See you on the next one.